Today to talk about the pain, the frustration, and the anger that many Americans are feeling this morning. In the midst of an unprecedented health care and economic crisis that is disproportionately affecting our minority communities, we've seen protests spring up across the country in response to egregious examples of injustice and violence against African Americans. Just in the past few weeks, there have been graphic videos of Ahmad Ambri gunned down while jogging on a street in Georgia, of a white woman in Central Park calling 911 to falsely accuse an African American man of threatening her, and of George Floyd pleading for his life as a white officer pressed his knee onto his neck for nearly nine minutes in Minnesota, killing him. Joining many others, I've made it clear that what happened to these Americans is outrageous and unacceptable. It was very hard to watch that video of George Floyd, a man who his family described as a gentle giant, literally begging for his life. I can't breathe, he said. Don't kill me, he pleaded. Those were his final words. This simply cannot be allowed to continue in America. And by the way, no one I know in law enforcement believes this behavior should be allowed either. Each of these acts and other acts of injustice against black Americans is deeply troubling in its own right. The combination of these injustices right now in the midst of concerns about the disproportionate impact of the coronavirus on communities of color has created a firestorm. Right now, many feel overwhelmed by the sadness, anger, and helplessness. Our hearts are with the families of George Floyd, Ahmaud Arbery, and every American who's experienced injustices in the shadows, away from the cameras, outside of the news headlines, in their daily lives. It's good that federal, state, and local investigations are underway in the Floyd and Arbery cases, and just that murder charges have been filed. We must all demand that justice be served fully and thoroughly. We are a nation of laws, and we must work to uphold those laws to protect everyone. But my fear is, like so many other times in our nation's history, what will happen is that these killings will fade from the public's consciousness, and we will move silently back to the status quo. We can't allow that to happen this time. It is past time for us to have a robust and inclusive national dialogue on racial inequities and some difficult but necessary conversations about how we move forward as a country. Over the past couple of days, I've spoken with the mayors of Cleveland, Cincinnati, and Columbus, our three biggest cities in Ohio, all three of which have had peaceful protests and destructive rioting. I commend each of them for their support of citizens demonstrating peacefully and for what they have done to try to stop the violence. We talked about cultivating hope for a better world. I will continue to try to use this podium here in the U.S. Senate to foster unity and discussions with my colleagues, my constituents, and leaders across Ohio. We need to work together to find solutions that promote strong families and communities that treat each other with respect and dignity. One place to start, I believe, is by holding up those police departments around the country that have made substantial reforms in training and accountability and improved relationships with communities of color, all the while ensuring better public safety for their citizens. In my hometown of Cincinnati, in the wake of similar racial justice protests in 2001, I worked alongside local officials to develop a better relationship of shared respect between the black community and our police officers. It's called the Collaborative Agreement. It's not a perfect system, and it's been tested, but it's also proven to be a valuable tool to ensure a continuous and open dialogue between the African-American community and the police force. And there's been a measurable drop. The data's there, a measurable drop in Cincinnati, in cases both where police officers used excessive force and where officers themselves were injured. The federal government provided support for this program. A lot of the support came in terms of the computer systems and the data and the transparency and accountability. There's more work to be done, 
so the federal role should continue in Cincinnati, but this may be a model for other cities to follow as well. As we look at what actions this body should take, I've been encouraged by some of the good ideas brought forward by some of my colleagues. My colleague from South Carolina, Senator Tim Scott, is introducing a bill that would encourage greater reporting of fatalities that occur while individuals are under arrest or in police custody. When we know more about what is happening and emerging trends, I believe we will be better able to address the right public policy approach. Now would also be a good time, in my view, to establish a national commission, a national commission on race as was done in 1967 by President Johnson in response to the civil unrest of that era. Perhaps the honorary co-chairs of such a commission could be people of standing, like former Presidents Obama and Bush, both of whom have spoken eloquently about racism as a stain on our national character. This would not be a commission to restate the problem, but to focus on solutions and send a strong moral message that America must live up to the ideal that God created all of us as equal. Sadly, there are those who are trying to take advantage of the pain and suffering by instigating acts of violence aimed at the police, looting, vandalizing, and setting fires. Usually in the very communities that are suffering so much, it pains me to see the disrespect that has been shown by some, including to some of our small business owners and their employees in these communities watching something be destroyed that they have spent their lifetime building. It pains me to see some of the disrespect being shown some of the officers who are doing their job in a professional manner. And it heartens me to see some of the peaceful demonstrators trying to stop these destructive acts. Violence is not the answer that will only serve to further divide an already polarized country. As George Floyd's younger brother Terrence said yesterday, quote, it's okay to be angry, but channel your anger to do something positive or make a change another way because we've been down this road already. The anger damaging your hometown is not the way he'd want, end quote. We cannot dismiss the anger and frustration that has driven so many to the streets for peaceful protests these past few days. The anger on display is real, it's raw, and it deserves to be heard and respected. This is something we must all learn from, and we must support the rights of those who are demonstrating peacefully. But the answer is not violence. The answer is to insist justice be served. The answer is to listen to those who have felt the sting of racism. The answer is to acknowledge when racial disparities and inequities occur, and the answer is to work together to address these longstanding injustices going forward. I yield back my time.